Hello and welcome from Liberty Fest in Brisbane. Uh, we're lucky to be able to sit down with uh, two of the, or should I say, keynote, keynote speakers of this uh, conference. We've got uh, Callum Thwaites and uh, Tony Morris uh, QC. Uh, Callum was one of the uh, defendants in the uh, QUT 18C case and uh, Tony Morris was the QC who uh, uh, defended them and, and won the case in the end. So thank you both of you for uh, giving us your time. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Thank you very much. Now obviously this is probably five years ago, you probably didn't expect to or be in the role that you're in now. Um, obviously, Callum, you were brought into, into this world uh, involuntarily. Um, I don't want to go over the, the facts again of the case, but I'm more interested in the uh, in terms of the emotional journey for you. I mean, because you know, having you know your you know, reputation you know slandered you know in public like that must have been you know tough and like obviously with social media it, it's much worse. Can you obviously you you know come out fighting now, but you, can you go through what the journey was like? Oh, it was terrible. There was a, a point of time where I thought maybe I should have just paid five thousand dollars and run away and, and not have to deal with this. It was um, heart-wrenching every day looking on the on Google, Googling my name, looking on Facebook, looking on Twitter, seeing the kinds of vitriol that was coming out of certain members of the public. This um, happened with my, my mother was doing it as well. Every morning she would Google my name to see what new article was being written. Um, it, it took a toll. I've got these Horrible grey hairs all of a sudden. I feel like I've aged ten years in, in two. But I'm I'm thankful to say that we're on the on the outside of it now, and um, that it's a it's a relief to to not have to deal with it anywhere near as much as it was during the case. And Tony, you uh, decided to take on this case now. Um, uh, from my point of view, you so burst burst onto the scene and. Yeah. Uh, I was very impressed with uh, after the, the the case was dismissed. Your um, I should call it just a spray at, at Gillian Triggs. I, I don't mean to um, diminish the the rest of your career, but you've really come into your element uh, now. So why was this battle important for you? Well, it actually started off in a very funny way. Um, a, a message was sent around by an organisation called Q, Q Pilch, which provides legal assistance, free legal assistance to people in various situations. The message came round late January. I read it, I thought, well, this is nonsense, this case. I mean, this will be over in half a day, and why wouldn't you give up half a day of your time for the sake of uh, some uni students? Um, Twelve months later, it was still going. It, and I guess I became... Uh, radicalised by that process, um, the, the, the sheer wickedness of a system and of a piece of legislation that allows decent people like Callum and Jackson and Alex and the others to be dragged into court over such nonsense. And you know, I'll let you into a little secret: lawyers aren't always the most popular people in our society. You may not have come across this, but, but we're not all that popular. Um, and you start to understand why lawyers aren't popular when you see legislation like this being used in such such an awful way, in such a, a spiteful and vindictive and unmeritorious way. And it really does give you a great feeling to have the opportunity to be a small part of putting the system right. And obviously, uh the case were worked out in in your favour. The the judge uh, said it was uh, frivolous. But during the, obviously it you thought that it would only last a last a day, and there was a it, the process dragged out for you know, many many months. And the, we know that the Human Rights Commission sat on the the complaint for a year. Do you feel that the process was designed to just make you uh, concede and? No, settle. There, there is no question about that. The process was set up to force people to settle out of court because of a fear that uh, of what was involved with exposure. And if if it wasn't Callum Thwaites, if it was Woolworths or Coles or Westpac or ANZ or 
Mount Isa Mines or BHP, there is no doubt in the world that they would have written a cheque because that's cheaper than all the bad publicity. And that's what ATNC is designed to do. And it's only because they picked, in this particular case, a few guys who, A, didn't really have the spare cash to, to pay what was being demanded, and B, had enough social conscience to say, well, I'm not going to pay something where I've done nothing wrong. Um, for those reasons, this was exposed for what it is. It's been going on for 20 years. This is the first time that the Australian public's been able to, to look at what is actually going on. Hello, do you want to add to that? I think that that's pretty much correct. The whole point of, or the whole way that the Human Rights Commission operated, um, and we haven't seen how it operates now with the, the new amendments, but it was very much um, emphasising the secrecy and confidentiality of the system and reminding people of the dangers that occur once you get out of the Human Rights Commission and into the courts where it's public record, journalists will know about it, the media will get involved, you've got the, the smear on you and you, you can't get rid of it. Once someone calls you a racist, it's particularly difficult to get rid of. And 9 out of 10 people will give in to whatever settlement is, is coming their way. In fact, that was the, the original attempt of the, the university in this case, was to give in to the settlement until the settlement offer changed and suddenly became a, a six-figure settlement. And uh, obviously, the, uh, as I mentioned, the, you, you were triumphant uh, in the end, and uh, obviously this case was quite prominent in the media, especially uh, people who you know, believe in you know, freedom of speech, uh, obviously saw that you know this who'd been talking about ATNC for for many years highlighted you know this is why ATNC is is problematic and uh, post this case you two have probably turned into this nation's uh, most prominent uh, freedom warriors you, know, you were named the Australian newspapers uh, Australians of the year for uh, 20, 2017 so how do you, how do you feel now about your your newfound uh, I guess. Uh, what, what you call it, careers as uh, freedom warriors? Well, if, if I can go first, um, it really is curious how life plays out. Um, perhaps even more so for Callum than it is for me because it, it really changed his whole, whole life. But, you know, I've been, I've been, I think, fighting the good fight for 30 years, but it takes one prominent case like this to get it into the the public mindset. Um, you know, I've, I've always felt very passionate about the fundamental freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, um, freedom from political manipulation, all the, all the basics that our common law uh, protects. And in some ways, uh, and obviously I'm being a little bit cynical in saying this, but in some ways we should be thankful to Cindy Pryor, because if she hadn't commenced this case, the, those of us who think ATNC has no place in the legislation of a civilised democracy wouldn't have this perfect illustration of everything that's wrong with it. Um, Callum would still be struggling on in, in his aspiration to be a school teacher, and I would still be fighting the good fight um, without the, the public spotlight on me. And uh, obviously, uh, the this eighteen CQUT matter is not over yet because you're um, trying to find out now through the uh, the uh, minister, you're up to the administrative appeals tribunal, trying to find out how the Human Rights Commission uh, handled your complaint. Why why have you chosen to still you know, pursue this matter further? Why is it important? Well. Cal would probably say it's just because I'm big-headed and eccentric. Um, I, it is a fundamental view of mine that one cannot give in to bureaucracy uh, when they choose to oppress the people that they're supposed to be serving. Um, in this case, we had the Australian Information Commissioner whose statutory duty is whose fundamental responsibility 
is to help citizens who are looking for access to government documents. And he's totally washed his hands of this, this case and said, no, he's not going to give us any help, not even going to consider it, not going to look into it, not going to do anything about it. Well, we just had to challenge that as a matter of principle. I think it's also for completeness. Um, we know this happened in, in our situation where respondents weren't given anywhere near notice that they should have been. If it's happened once, what's to say it hasn't happened before? So that's really the, the information we were looking for is, is, has this happened before? What kind of situations has it been where you've not told respondents about cases or given them very short notice? And they're the documents that, that we're trying to see uh, that we've just been stonewalled. About. So it's, it's really just a, a completeness to see how often they've done this before they got caught out. And, and I think the other element that we can't ignore is that when the decision came down by His Honour Judge Jarrett clearing the, these fellows of uh, any breach of Section 18C, within 72 hours the ABC had lined up a series of tame interviews for Professor Triggs. She goes on television and she tells straight out lies, not exaggerations, not distortions, not ambiguities, just straight out lies. Why were the students not told about these claims for 14 months? Oh, well, some of them were on holidays, some of them were overseas, they were different. No, the actual reason, Professor Triggs, is you didn't bother, you didn't try to contact them. Not that they were on holidays, not that they were overseas, not that they were difficult to contact. You had their names, you had their addresses, you could have contacted them if you wanted to, but you didn't. Now, a point has to be reached where that sort of deliberate obfuscation by a public figure um, gets called into question. Other otherwise, the whole system breaks down. Now, obviously, because of what happened to you, Helen, it's reignited the push to repeal or, repeal or reform 18C at a federal level, and we saw the Turnbull government at least uh, propose an amendment to uh, 18C to uh, to only be uh, harass or intimidate, if, I, if I'm correct. Uh, do you believe uh, that... Are you optimistic that... 18C and, for that matter, the, the Human Rights Commission, um, you know, the havoc that, that it's wreaking on ordinary Australians, that that might come to an end sometime soon? Well, I don't think that we're going to see re reform or abolishing of 18C anytime soon. Um, it's not looking like we're going to have a strong conservative majority in the next few years, um, based on how, how the government's polling. But what I think may have happened is that 18C will be a bit like dead letter legislation. It's just, it's on the books, but no one dares touch it anymore. Um, there is a, currently an 18C case in the Federal Circuit Court against the Australian newspaper and some journalists, but that came through before the changes to the Human Rights Commission that make it slightly more difficult to bring nonsense cases to the courts. With those in place, I'd be surprised if we see any cases come to the courts in, in the near future. I, I think Callum's right. I don't think we will ever see another case like the QUT case. Um, the changes that the government did get through, and, and to be fair to the Turnbull government, particularly to George Brandis, they haven't been given enough credit for what they were able to achieve. And the changes that they did achieve mean that the chances of such a case ever, ever getting to, to a court are very, very slight indeed. Now, my final question is now, Callum, you actually now work for, for Tony as a, a clerk, and obviously you've you know, become quite uh, close. Do you feel that you've you know, learnt and been inspired by each other? Oh, absolutely. I wholly blame Tony for my decision to go into law. Uh, the first day that we met, Tony said to me, oh, I think you'd be a good barrister. So at that stage, I was sure that I wouldn't be able to become a teacher. So I thought, I'll, I'll drop my teaching degree and start law and see what happens. And it's probably one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah, well, I, I actually feel very guilty for having deprived the children of Queensland of what I think would have been a very good school teacher, but uh, the loss to the educational profession will be made up for, uh, and more than made up for, by the gain to the legal profession. 
Well, I hope that uh, you to continue to, to tell your story to as many people as possible. I believe that the tide is turning against, you know, 18 C and in favour of uh, free speech. So, you know, congratulations on you know, taking taking up this fight, and all the best. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. This has been an unshackled fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.